Our speaker uh, today is Chris Bartley, of course. Chris is the associate pastor, youth pastor, at uh, the Pikeville United Methodist Church, where he has served for 14 years now. Doesn't seem possible, and was a volunteer for 13 years before that. How many, how many senior pastors have you gone through during that time? I think eight. <laughs> had, to, had to break in eight every time. <laughs> uh, Chris and his lovely wife, Billy, uh, have three kids, Devin, Caden, and Abigail. Abigail's with us here, very talented and beautiful. His wife, Billy, leads the youth alongside Chris and his favorite volunteer. And I know you have a lot of kids. How many midweek kids do you have? About 80. About 80 kids uh, during the week they have over there. It's amazing. Chris studied uh, music education at the University of Kentucky and is currently taking classes through the United Methodist course of study. I know, uh, was part of that when you went to England uh, not too long ago last year? Yeah. Uh, Chris is a licensed pastor and appointed by the bishop to serve the students of Pike County. Uh, together, Chris and Billy have a mission to have every teen in Pike County hear the gospel from a friend. And you can tell this by how passionate they are about uh, training others and sharing the gospel themselves. Please welcome uh, my good friend, Chris Martin. Well, it's good to be here. Um, as he said, uh, normally I, I'm, I'm talking to youth, and so normally there's a pile of pizza in the room. And so this is a little different for me. Um, before we get to our text, I want you to journey with me. And it's kind of amazing. Uh, I came early and we kind of sat through Sunday school, and I'm like, that's kind of what I'm talking about. We talked about a journey through life. And so I want to you, before we journey into the text, I want you to journey with me to some time I spent in the Dominican Republics a few years ago uh, on some mission trips. I would go every year with the medical school, and uh, I went seven times with them. And, and it was a very special time to be there, but it's also a very special time. Um, in, in my life, uh, still today. And, and what happened there was what I would like to refer to as a collision of urgent physical needs and urgent spiritual needs. It's where they come together. Urgent physical needs. Um, there are people there that were in such need. I mean, they were just... Uh, imagine spending time with children, elementary age, like that was just up here, um, whose only meal in a 24-hour span was a measured bowl of rice and beans. And we worked at this feeding center, and kids would show up, and, and they would be, just be naked. Um, that age, or, or maybe they would have a t-shirt because that's the only resources they would have um, at all. Um, the leading cause of death on the island for, for a, a child of that age was diarrhea or simple infection, something we can just go to the over-the-counter and get a cure for today, you know, here where we are. Uh, poverty is just rampant. And I truly encountered the people that my mother would tell me about as I was growing up. Had urgent physical needs, and they were very evident. Urgent spiritual needs. The island housed several witch doctors who would practice black magic, and, and they prey on these poverty-stricken families who were always looking for hope of some kind. They would set up shop in these villages, and for a, a nominal fee, they would uh, call upon a spirit or a god or, or a, 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 a demon um, for these people. I mean, it was purely for money. It was evil. Um, I experienced one night, we were in our dorm, and I was looking through a makeshift window, and, and the dorm was made out of cinder blocks, and they would turn them sideways and make the window to where you could see out the hole. And I was looking out the hole one night, and a witch doctor had made a fire in front of our dorm and was literally praying against us um, because of the good news we were bringing to these people. Um, it's the, for the first time I really realized how real spiritual warfare was. Her primary job on the island was to spread the gospel. And, and, and most, most of the people that we had encountered had never heard of Jesus. Um, or, or maybe just hardly heard of Him. 
When we would talk to, to them about Jesus, they would look at us as if we were talking about a mystical creature from a faraway place. Um, the collision of need was there, and it was very evident. Um, you could see it in the faces of the people. I remember the face of the one man. He would walk on his knuckles because his legs had become paralyzed from a simple infection. He was working in the sugarcane field and a stalk had cut his leg and it had caused an infection that had paralyzed him from the waist down. We encountered him in his small, probably five by ten hut. Uh, he came walking on his knuckles and I, he opened the door and he was there. And I, so I started talking to him. He had never heard of Jesus. And every day he was getting closer and closer to death. I remember the look on a mother's face who heard that there were these strange people in the village who were praying to a God that had authority. She brought her baby who had meningitis and he hung lifeless in her arms. She had never heard of Jesus and was desperate for hope. And I see similar things. As I walk through the hallways of the schools I visit here in our very own community, I feel the pain of a child as I unload a supply of backpack food in the office of one elementary. Uh, this second grade boy who was looking at me as I was unloading it, he thanked me for bringing the food. And I said, you're welcome. And then he went on to tell me how hard his mom worked and how she tries and how what was in that little bag was just enough to get him through. He hadn't been to church and he had never heard that Jesus loves even him. I look into the eyes of teenager, this one in particular who is being sent to reform school because home is chaotic because mom and dad are on drugs and alcohol. And, and this child's life was a reflection of just that. The only consistent thing was that they weren't going to have dinner and that there was going to be some sort of fight somewhere that night. The only thing consistently that this child was told was that this was their destiny and they were never going to be anything more. Felt so powerless, so hopeless. They needed Jesus. No hope. So how do we respond? How do we respond to this collision of urgent physical needs and urgent spiritual needs? What if someone's starving? Why, well, we would go to any means to make sure that food was delivered. Um, we would do anything if we saw a child who needed shoes or medicine. You would do anything to help change the reality of that child who eats dry macaroni on the back of a bus because they're so hungry they can't make it home. It's one thing to think about evangelism and mercy within the confines of our four walls where we're at work or at home or in a church where it's air conditioned and we are comfortable. It's another to wrestle theology as you look into the face of a family who is living in a homeless shelter and are just trying to put their life back together. The reality is that these things don't just happen there, but they happen here. They happen here and we as a community of believers are doing good things to try to make a difference in, in this point of impact where the collision is happening. We're surrounded by physical and spiritual needs every day. Every day we walk by people, as we talked about in Sunday school, who need both the hope of Jesus and a meal. And that's why today we're going to hear a passage from Mark 2 that is completely applicable to where we are in our world right now. I think we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to do whatever it takes um, to get someone to Jesus? Everybody knows someone who, who has this need, who needs to hear the hope and the healing power and the freedom that only comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And are you willing to do whatever it takes to get them there? Our passage this morning comes from Mark 2, verses 1 through 11. And this is a story about four men who are willing to do whatever it takes to get their friend to Jesus. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, and he was carried by four of them. 
Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the man on a mat that the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take up your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up. He took his mat and he walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God by saying, we have never seen anything like this. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word this morning. So let's think about this situation. I mean, here's Jesus teaching in a house, and it's so crowded that nobody else can even get in. But these four guys, they have a friend, and this friend has this need. And, and, and his need is obvious. He is paralyzed. And they're going to do whatever it takes. I mean, whatever it takes to get their friend to Jesus. So what do they do? They dig a hole. They dig a hole through this roof, and they realize that he is worth the trouble. It's worth the trouble because Jesus could heal him both physically and spiritually. These men were so convinced that they would do whatever it took to get their friend to Jesus. Think about our time last summer in Denver, Colorado. We took a group uh, of students on a trip to Colorado Christian where we were trained in, in, in strategic prayer and evangelism. And, and we would literally throw block parties and share the gospel. We'd go door to door and share the gospel. And it was just a huge explosion inside of our group. But I think about that. And I think about this preacher that, that one night that gave a challenge for everyone to call a friend that didn't know Jesus. And not just to do it later, but to do it right now. And so one phone call was made, and I watched, and I took part. And, and as this one boy, he made contact with his friend, and, and he was telling him about the gospel. And he said, okay, I'll call you back later. So he called him back. And then over the next few days, lots of conversation, lots of dialogue happened. And then at lunch, he comes and he tells me, he said, Chris, my friend accepted Jesus. I said, that's amazing. What did you do? He said, I told him, put me on hold and go tell his mommy. <laughs> and he did. From Denver, Colorado, on a phone, he calls his friend and tells him about Jesus. I think we need to be reminded of the urgency of getting this message out to others, especially those people who are close to us. So many times it is about a Bible study or it's about a meeting and, and it seems like we have a meeting and we have a series of meetings. In fact, we have a meeting to get ready for this meeting. Then after the meeting's over, we're going to have another meeting to talk about how much better this meeting could have been so the future meeting will be better. So how do we get the gospel to people? A couple of years ago, we were in Sunday school, and there was just a small group of us. And we were kind of in between lessons, and we had this kind of lingo week. And, and, and so we had just finished a, a, a small study of evangelism, and, uh, and we were like, what are we going to do? I said, well, let's just review for a minute. And so we took about five minutes, and we went over the past six weeks of what we had talked about, about sharing the gospel and having the boldness to do it. And I said, everybody got it. And they said, I think we do. I said, good, let's go get in the van. And so we went and we loaded the church van. We went to Walmart and I put them in teams of three. And I said, go find somebody in Walmart. Pray for them. Tell them about Jesus. And they, they did. They were not excited as I was about the project. But they went. And they encountered different people. And as I, my group would go, we would see other people talking about talking and praying. And you'd see them holding hands and, and different things all through Walmart over here in Pikeville. Workers, people, hearing the gospel. And so we, we met back in about 20 minutes or so. And we came back to church. And uh, I said, well, how'd it go? And, and they were excited to tell their stories. Not all of them were positive. They had a few of them that, um, that told them no, that they were good, that they didn't need that. Um, 
but it challenged them. And it wasn't something that was abstract or on paper. It was real, had real faces, had a real life, and it had real consequences. It was a game changer. It lit a fire inside of them and inside of me. And since that day, we've not looked backwards. Even during this time of quarantine, we've seen students use an app on their cell phone to lead other people to Jesus. And they're willing to do whatever it takes to make it happen. What if our churches were like that? What if the people who sit in our pews were willing to go and to do whatever it takes to bring people to do? What if we really went out and we told our friends and our co-workers about the saving power that Jesus Christ has? It would be worth the trouble. It would be worth the risk. Sometimes we read through these familiar stories and we really don't think them through. These guys took a huge risk. Four guys, guys climbed up on the roof and they cut a hole through a roof. Now, it wasn't their house um, just to get their friend to Jesus. I did just a little research about ancient roofs, and, and they were about between a foot and two foot thick. Um, the top four to six inches were made of solid clay to keep the water from coming through. So what these guys did would require some intense tools. And I started to bring a big axe, you know, uh, but, but I didn't. I want to come back one day. Um, <laughs> but it would take some intense tools uh, I want you to imagine these guys having shovels and pickaxes and things on this roof as they began to dig a hole, to chop a hole through a roof. Can you imagine being in the room? I mean, I mean, you, you hear this start to happen and, and particles, maybe some debris starts to come down from the roof, first a little, then a lot. I mean, we've all had a baby cry and church be kind of, you know, this was the roof coming in. Um, one scholar estimates that it took probably 40 minutes for them to dig through the roof and they wouldn't quit. Then after all the chaos, after the hole is opened up, um, Jesus still teaching, this mat is lowered down. Lowered down into the room in front of Jesus and nestled in it was this paralyzed man. Imagine the feeling in that room. Um, I've been late for church before and you're scared to sneak in and sit in the back. These guys tore a hole in the roof and come to the front. I think it's interesting that Mark doesn't record a single spoken word by that man or his friends. Um, they had worked so hard to get them there, but yet not a word is recorded by them. I imagine Jesus looking down at the man and then looking up to his friends. What expression, I wonder, is on their face? Um, well, were they nervous? Were they anxious? Were they smiling? I think we could safely assume they were trying to catch their breath. And we don't know exactly what Jesus saw in the face of those friends, but whatever it was, it was the face of faith. And Jesus said to the man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now this is kind of odd because the man never asked for this. He didn't ask to be forgiven of his sins. In fact, he was probably hoping for something completely different. But this pronouncement shocked the crowd. This man has sin, and Jesus has the authority to forgive him. And this made the scribes question in their hearts the penalty for blasphemy. And they started pondering, does this teacher need to be put to death? Now, while the text says that they didn't say anything out loud, Jesus saw in their hearts, and he knew that they were questioning. And he says, which is easier, to forgive sins or to cure paralysis? Then after a pause, he says, I'm going to show you, because I have the authority to forgive sins. And he tells the man to get up and to take his mat and to go home. Now, imagine the amazement of those guys looking down through this hole. Um, imagine the amazement and the pure delight that four friends that wouldn't give up till they got their friend to Jesus as they peered down into this room um, through this fresh cut hole in the roof. The man stood. He stood and immediately picked up his bed and ran out of the room. And it's kind of funny that the crowd let him out. They wouldn't let him in, but they let him out. 
Can you imagine the friends coming off the room, off the roof, the way they were celebrating? Uh, did you see just what happened? Can you, can you believe this? You know, uh, they probably forget that they had just destroyed somebody's house. <laughs> and then they speak you know, for the first time in the entire story. And they say, we've never seen anything like this. They were amazed at the power of Jesus' words. And there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of stories in the Bible. But there's only one story that has power, and it's the story of Jesus Christ. It's the good news, and it's the gospel. It's the greatest story that's ever been told that we hardly ever tell. There's an urgent need in our world today for this story to be told. It's, it has the power to change things. Politicians, governments, programs, movements, they don't have that kind of power. It is the resurrected Christ that can offer an eternal difference, and that's our job to take it to the world. We are passionate about this as we talk to students and we talk to people everywhere we go. This man in our story today, he had an urgent need. His physical need was very evident. He was paralyzed. But more importantly, this man's spiritual need was ultimate. This man uh, had a physical paralysis, but his spiritual need for salvation was the most important thing. This man was a sinner, which meant that his ultimate need was not healing from God, but holiness before God. And his ultimate need is the same need that we have in all of our lives. Our ultimate need has never been physical, but our ultimate need is always spiritual. In fact, every physical element we have goes back to where sin enters the world. Um, that was the very start of pain and suffering. Our major problem is that we're separated from God by sin in a world that is full of suffering. So our ultimate need is not to be made physically whole, but is to be reconciled with our Creator. And we think, I'm a good person. See, in this story, we see that Jesus has the authority to see into our hearts. And this scares me. Just like the scribes, he can see in our hearts. He sees all of our hidden motives, all of our secret thoughts, all of our sins that we don't want anybody else to know about. And not one of us escapes that gaze. Uh, nothing in our lives is hidden from his eyes. Jesus has the authority to heal. And I pray, I pray that I never lose awe of that. That Jesus has the power to speak and paralysis disappears. By Jesus' words, things are made different. Jesus speaks and disease is gone. Jesus speaks and demons run. Jesus, Jesus speaks and even death itself obeys. Jesus has the authority to heal our sickness. Let's never forget that. None of those things that I just mentioned are sovereign. Only Jesus is sovereign. Disease is not sovereign. Demons are not sovereign. Even death is not sovereign. And then if that's not good enough, it gets better. Because this text tells us that Jesus has the authority to forgive our sins. And this is the greatest news that we will ever receive. Jesus has the authority to forgive our sins. And I said earlier that our ultimate problem was that we are separated from God by sin in a world that is full, and I mean full, of suffering. So our ultimate need is to be reconciled with God. And this is what Jesus came to do. And the scribes were right. Only God can forgive sins. Um, what they failed to see was God was in the flesh standing right before their very eyes. And this is the good news of the Bible. It's the greatest news in the entire world. And right now, our news could use some good. Um, God himself stepped into our world as Jesus Christ. And he bore the pain of our death and, and our sins by dying on the cross. And this is the good news. Uh, the, the good news, he didn't stay dead for long. Um, he defeated it and he rose again after three days and now he offers that forgiveness to anyone and I mean anyone who calls upon his name. This is the gospel. It's the good news that we are called to take to the world. 
And when we take the gospel to the world, we go and we explain what Jesus did and we tell them about this forgiveness that He offers us and that it's available to them and it's far better than anything else that could ever happen in their life. And then we can say at that point that Jesus has the final word. With, with, with bodies that are wasting away, Jesus never leaves us. We can know that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor neither our fears nor our worries about today or tomorrow, not death nor anything in creation, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love and the power of Jesus Christ for the salvation of anyone who calls upon His name. So for everyone who trusts in Jesus Christ, you can know that cancer will not have the final word. That tumors will not have the last word. That Alzheimer's will not have the last word. Parkinson's will not have the last word. Pain, heart attacks, hospital rooms, hospice care, they will not have the last word. Even death itself will not have the last word. Because death has been defeated by Jesus and He has the last word. The good news is not that Jesus will heal you of your sins right now, heal you of your pain right now, but the good news is that Jesus will forgive you of your sins forever. And that's the message that we're called to take to the world. And, and we need to be willing to do whatever it takes um, to get that message out. Why? Well, I'll tell you my life personally, um, because there was a lady who was willing to do whatever it took to get me to come to Jesus. I went to a little church in Elkhorn City and there was a lady there, Gwendolyn, and she would lead this little Sunday school class and there was three of us, three of us. And every week she would tell us stories and truths about Jesus Christ and about, about uh, the hope and the salvation that He offered us. Now, I'm not saying she was the best, but all three become preachers. <laughs> but she was willing to do whatever it took to get that message to me. And I know I need to be willing to do whatever it takes to get that message everywhere I go. Just over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ was in heaven and He got up and in a sense He tore a hole in the floor of heaven and He came down to save us. He was willing to go to the cross. He was willing to do whatever it took to get to us. And at the same time we need to be willing to do whatever it takes to get people to Him. To get this message to our friends, to our family, and to the world. And if you're here right now, if you're here right now and you've never accepted Jesus into your life, you need to know that that same power is available for you. The same power that has transformed my life is available for you. And I don't want to miss this moment. I don't want to miss this moment. If, you, if you've ever wanted this wholeness and this healing, today's the day. And if that's you, uh, in a minute we're going to sing a song. If you would like to have somebody to pray with you, we invite you to come down. I don't know how you guys do it, but if you want, we'll come pray with you where you're at or whatever it takes. Um, if you've already accepted Jesus in your life, you've been given a mission. And that mission is to take this message to the world. So where can you take it? I'm going to give you the same challenge that a pastor gave me one time. I'm going to give you this 48-hour challenge. Um, this 48-hour challenge is to tell someone about Jesus within the next 48 hours. Um, why 48 hours? Well, studies show that if you don't apply what you've learned within 48 hours, your willingness or, or even uh, uh, your ability to do it is significantly decreased, reduced to almost having no chance of you ever acting on what you've heard. So 48 hours. So who's that person? Who's that person that needs this message? And what are you willing to do to take it to them? I'm not saying go cut a hole in their roof. But what I'm saying is sometimes we have to have a hard conversation. Um, sometimes we ha it's a little bit awkward. And in our youth group we have a, a saying that says awkward is awesome. And Jesus was the king of awkward conversations. And so with that same boldness that Jesus Christ gave His disciples, um, I'm going to tell you to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, 
and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Do whatever it takes to get somebody to Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we are thankful. We are thankful for your son, Jesus, who did come and die on a cross, not just for me, but for us. If you want to know uh, the importance of it, it says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. It's not by country or race or political party, but he says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. And Father, I pray that people realize that. Um, in their lives today. Pray, Father, that you do give us the boldness, the boldness to, to, to speak words of life, to speak words of truth to people we love, even people who we are just passing by, to find opportunities. Father, I pray for those opportunities, that you put people in our path, that, that we have the opportunity to share your name. Pray, Father, for this place. I pray for Larry and for the good works that it, this place is doing and the good works that he is doing, Father, that you continue to be faithful and true and strong for them. I pray, Father, that as we leave here, that we know we don't go alone, that you are with us everywhere we go. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.